uh, Dr. James Evans. He received his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from University of California, Davis in 2007. He was a postdoctoral researcher at Lawrence uh, Livermore National Lab and then moved to New York, University of California, Davis in 2009, where he was awarded his first grant as PI for the development of in-situ transmission electron uh, microscopy. He joined the uh, Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory at PNNL in 2011 and is currently a staff scientist leading multiple projects with a focus on advancing bioimaging and cryo-electron mm -hmm. research. He is the PNL lead and co-PI of the Pacific Northwest Cryo EM Center that we're going to hear about today. Thanks, Bobby Doe. I am honored to introduce Steve Reichow from the OHSU side. Steve obtained his PhD at the University of Washington, where he used NMR to solve protein structures. He then did his postdoctoral research at UW and HHMI at Janelia Farms using Cryo EM to investigate protein structure. He joined the faculty at Portland State University in 2014 and was promoted to associate professor in 2020 with a joint appointment at OHSU. He is relocating to OHSU full-time this fall, so we're so excited to have him. His lab applies biochemical methods coupled with atomic level imaging and structure determination by cryo-EM to understand protein function. It is through this research that he became intimately involved in the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center called the PNCC and was recently appointed as the OHSU side co-lead for the PNCC. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to James and Steve. If, if anyone has questions and they need clarification, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Uh, otherwise, we'll have time for questions at the end. Yeah, great. Thanks everyone for being here and, and for the invitation to give this talk. Um, it's exciting for me, it's the first time uh, actually presenting uh, uh, about PNCC to uh, these communities. And I think this might be the first time I've ever done a talk, uh, a co-talk together um, in the same room. So James and I are gonna <laughs> share the responsibility of giving the presentation today. And uh, yeah, so we'll get started. So the, PNCC, the Pacific Northwest Center for Cryo-EM, is uh, a partnership uh, between our two institutions, OHSU and PNNL, that was founded in 2018. And it specializes in, in providing access and training in this technology of, of electron cryo microscopy. And so for today's talk, uh, I wanted to start with uh, a little bit of background about what is this technology of CryoEM for those who may not be completely familiar, um, and what led NIH to invest in the development of these national centers. And then we're going to go on and give a little bit of a history of the development of PNCC um, leading up to its current state, and talk a little bit about the impacts that uh, the centers had on its communities and uh, kind of the future vision for the centers moving forward. And as Laura mentioned, if, if there's any clarifications we can give along the way, um, just let us know. And so I'll start with a little bit of an overview of CryoEM and, and kind of uh, what the lead up to the development of PNCC. And so I'd like to start just kind of from the viewpoint of a structural biologist and um, with the, the kind of goal of, of really trying to understand the world of biology at the molecular and even at the atomic level. And I like this quote that I'm showing here at the bottom from Richard Feynman. It says, everything that living things do can be understood in terms of the jiggling and wiggling of atoms. And, you know, this is uh, maybe, a, you know, a, a more kind of physicist point of view of biology, but it, it does represent how a structural biologist looks at the biological world. And what's always kind of um, um, fascinating me with this world is kind of the juxtaposition of the different uh, um, realms of science that it involves. So it's an overlap of biology, chemistry, physics, computational biology. And um, for me personally, it also involves this kind of uh, this what I call artwork or, or just um, kind of the beauty of visualizing mm -hmm. these nanoscale machines um, that that perform all these biological functions inside of our. And that's meant to be illustrated here with the. 
And so while this is an animation, it's, it's built off of um, the knowledge base that structural biologists have provided to the community and understanding what the atomic level structures of, of these components inside of our body look like in a three-dimensional world and, and how they perform their functions um, through multiple types of interactions, um, dynamical movement, and uh, um, exchange of energy, right? And so <clears throat> the interpretation of biology at the molecular level is, is very important for lots of different um, kind of translational fields of science. Um, I think over the last couple of years, we've all been um, very acutely aware of the importance of vaccine design. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, structural biology played an integral role in identifying the epitopes that are involved in these viruses and developing new types of antibodies to um, suppress these, these uh, viruses. And in general, in the field of small molecule drug discovery, these three-dimensional structures can be uh, hugely important to facilitate the design of, of novel drugs. So the idea of, of using computational-based methods to guide the design of small molecules that interact with and modulate the functions of proteins that are important to our physiology. And lastly, as an example of, of, of the use of structural biology is in this kind of um, um, rational design of, of novel biomolecules. So new types of proteins that can carry out functions that aren't found in nature. Uh, David Baker's lab at the University of Washington while I was there was it was uh, a luminary in this field and um, really had a big impact on on how I looked at structural biology and and how these structures can be manipulated uh, to perform many new functions. And so understanding the structures of proteins is important. Um, so how do we go about doing it? Uh, you know, you might ask the question is, is why we don't just look at the things, right? Why do, can't we just take a microscope and, and look at these molecules? And it comes out of the physical principle that these things are just too small to visualize by uh, using a traditional light microscope. So to visualize uh, these molecules that are so small, we need to illuminate them with a light source that has a wavelength that's on the order of magnitude of those particles. And it turns out with an electron microscope, we can achieve that. So under the right... Um, what we call acceleration voltage, the electron beam can be tuned to the wavelength that's appropriate to visualize um, individual biomolecules. And what you're seeing here on the screen is an electron micrograph of isolated virus particles. And they're visible because the electron beam is being diffracted uh, at, by uh, these, these particles as they uh, um, um, project the image onto a camera. Now, there's some limitations with this technology when we're imaging biological molecules. The first is that these molecules are very fragile, and so we can't just turn these microscopes up on high power like a material scientist would. The other limitation is was always thought to be inherent to the technology, and so as soon as the electron beam hits the specimen, the specimen starts to move, and so we'd always been left with these very blurry images. And in the field of structural biology, cryo-electron microscopists were referred to for many decades as blobologists because we were never able to define the structures of our target molecules with uh, very high resolution or very high levels of detail sufficient to interpret them at the atomic level. But the technology really got turned on its head about um, almost a decade ago now with an advent of a new type of detector. And these detectors had many sophisticated features to them, most notably is a very fast um, readout rate for recording these images. And what that allowed us to do was to correct uh, computationally that inherent movement of the specimen that occurs when we illuminate them with electron beam and allowed us to go from these blurry type of images like the one you see here to what we call motion corrected or a deep, an unblurred image um, like I'm showing you now. And you can hopefully appreciate the additional detail that is presented in this micrograph. And this kind of um, manipulation of technology really set off a, a revolution in the field. And that was demonstrated just a few months after this by Yifan Chang's lab at UCSF when they reported the structure 
of this small membrane protein known as TRPV1. This is a protein that is responsible for um, um, sensing heat and spicy foods inside of your mouth. And what was really impactful about this study was that it demonstrated uh, uh, two things. One, that cryo-EM could be used to resolve biomolecules at suitable resolution to interpret them at atomic level. And that two, it wasn't limited in the types of specimen that could be analyzed. So this was really impactful because of the type of protein this was. This was a membrane protein and membrane proteins had traditionally been almost prohibitive to structure determination by other methods. And so the impact of this technology was immediately apparent after this study. And over the last several years, the technology has really evolved and been um, the technology has grown alongside of it and to the point where we're now capable of resolving protein structures at truly atomic level resolution. And so what you see here are these meshes that you see are the, the, the density maps that we end up resolving after image processing our electron micrographs. And these blobs that you see are resolved individual atoms. So you can see the water molecule in the middle there with the highlighted in blue is the oxygen atom and the separated hydrogen atoms. And so at this point of the technological development, there's really no limitations um, to the, the level of resolution that we can achieve and the types of um, biological samples that can be characterized by this methodology. Now, just with all these wonderful um, um, strengths of the technology, there's many barriers uh, to accessing uh, cryo-EM for many uh, research programs. And I've tried to list a few of them for you here. So the first is, is that the equipment to, to record these types of um, really high resolution images are uh, extremely expensive, prohibitively so for many institutions. So they range a multi-million dollar instruments to be fully equipped with the types of cameras that are required for, for generating these data. They require highly specialized personnel to operate the instrumentation. Um, these instruments are extremely sensitive to uh, vibrational noise and electric magnetic uh, fields, and so you have to have appropriate infrastructure to house these instruments. And the amount of data that these um, instruments are capable of producing is, is really tremendous. And so uh, there's uh, significant storage requirements and, and infrastructure that are required for uh, moving large amounts of data around uh, in an efficient way. And so NIH recognized these barriers and uh, in 2017 put out a call to fund uh, three, up to three national cryo-EM centers with the overall mission of, of broadening access of these technologies to the broader community and to train a, a workforce that would be specialized in this technology to um, spread uh, amongst um, various institutions and to grow the field forward. And as it turned out, uh, OHSU and PNL's proposal was among the three that were selected by NIH for funding, and that led to the creation of the Pacific Northwest Center for Cryo-EM. And in the next part of the talk, James is going to give you a little bit more of the history behind uh, what led up to the development of our center. Thank you, Steve. So, um, one of the questions that we wind up getting asked quite a bit in terms of uh, the focus of this seminar series, PMedic, uh, which is another kind of joint institution uh, between uh, OHSU and PNNL, is how did how did we get PNCC uh, started? What was kind of the key ingredients that brought everything together and allowed us to get such a large award? Um, since both in both institutions individually probably couldn't have gotten it. And so the history of this, uh, for those of you who don't know, in January 2017, like Steve mentioned, the RFA came out from NIH to create these national centers. They were looking for three and it was going to be uh, funded through the NIH Common Fund. And at that time, Karen Rodland uh, was already in talks with OHSU about trying to formulate and create a PMedic. Um, and at the same time, she was also the PNNL um, steward for NIH research. 
I saw this uh, RFA when it came out and I actually walked down to Karen Rodlin's office and started talking to her about this. She hadn't seen it, started talking about the strengths that we have at PNNL, which was largely at that time due to um, housing and operating a national user facility for cryo EM through EMSL, um, which is a Department of Energy uh, funded user facility um, where my group worked inside that helping users for cryo EM. But then separately at PNNL, I was the only group that was really doing single particle research at that time. So while we had experience with uh, operating user facilities, as well as high performance computing, storing data and so forth, uh, we didn't really have a critical mass for science uh, in order to go for this. So I was talking with Karen about uh, interest of finding a partner. She was already uh, formulating the idea for PMedic and starting to socialize that. And during that meeting, uh, Joe Gray actually reached out uh, in an email to Karen and said, hey, have you seen this RFA? This might be something to continue with PMedic. Are you guys interested? And Karen responded back saying, actually, James is in my office. Let's get um, him put together with PIs at OHSU and see what we could do. And so this started kind of a flurry of conversations in January, February, March, a trip down from PNNL uh, for me and Karen um, to really kickstart some of these meetings uh, with Eric and Michael. And that grew into a larger team of investigators um, that wound up going in uh, for this uh, proposal. And like Steve mentioned, we were one of three that were selected. The, uh, the other two are in New York and in Stanford. And really uh, what helped set us apart was not only were we bringing together a team of researchers where OHSU really had a critical mass of researchers who really excelled at cryo EM expertise and so forth. They already had MMC, a very functional uh, user facility for a cryo EM, and it paired it with PNNL, um, the, who had a active system for user portal management, high performance computing, long term archival, and we leveraged the infrastructure and the team, as well as some additional in-kind funding, well, quite a bit of in-kind funding from OHSU, around 19 million to cover additional uh, space renovation, construction, and uh, partial new microscope and so forth. And so all of this together was really kind of the key ingredients that allowed PNCC to get selected. And in the peer reviews uh, from the NIH review panel, really they recognize the strength of bringing both institutions together. But one, like I mentioned, one of the key, uh, key ingredients was also the um, additional funding from OHSU to really construct and build out a new facility for this. And so uh, we wound up getting awarded in, uh, Feb in February, but started in May of 2018. Um, and then already in January of 2019, we had construction begin. And only about six months later, we were fully done with construction and had all of our instruments installed. And we were the first of the three centers to actually become fully operational with instruments. We had Antarctica and four Creoses already available for user research in September 2019. Now we actually uh, started user research by um, buying time on one of the OHSU instruments already in October 2018 and then had our first Creos come online in 2019 uh, in space that wasn't needing to be constructed. And so already four months into user research, we had about 30 proposals, but they weren't very spread out throughout the US. We had some on both the East and West coasts, um, but now three and a half years later, uh, in January 2022, um, we, you can see that we've covered a lot of area, including the states in red, which are the NIH IDEA states. And we've also received uh, proposals from academia, national laboratories, cancer research centers, even industry, and both in US and internationally. And to date, we've had over 775 unique users from 125 institutions. So we've really started to, well, we've really grown uh, to not just a national resource, but actually international one, um, but also reaching out to many different people. Now, one of the problems or challenges that Steve had mentioned earlier was a significant uh, hurdle that we had to overcome. The ability to handle data, um, not over, only between OHSU and PNNL, but then also distributing it to users uh, was a big challenge. Um, and this is, uh, uh, you, 
in the upper plot kind of shows um, based off of the y-axis on the left-hand side, you can see total file counts. And on the right-hand side, you can see total file size. And this is just uh, about a six-month period or so um, back in 2020 uh, when we were at steady state before COVID hit um, and then continuing through COVID showing that we really didn't change much in overall data flow. But it really highlights that uh, when we were in full operation and still now, we average uh, from a single day anywhere between five and 20 terabytes of data that has to stream from, P from OHSU to PNNL. So users interact with the center first by submitting their user uh, proposal through the portal managed uh, and administered through PNNL. Then they send samples or they come and visit the microscopes that are on site at OHSU. The data that's collected at OHSU then streams to the high performance computing system at PNNL and then gets distributed to users who can also access their data on that high performance computing system. So every image that comes off the microscope has to stream to PNNL. And then we not only archive that data, but also have to provide it available for download um, to institutions worldwide. And the rate of transfer can really vary depending on distance from um, the source. And so um, people kind of trying to access their data from Australia um, uh, had uh, significant slowdowns. And so we've actually had to revisit how we uh, allow data to be transferred and downloaded by users and created four different mechanisms for that in order to handle all the different uh, variables that come into play with different institutions and so forth. Another uh, aspect that we've had to evolve over the years is that originally we wound up uh, starting with data just being made available to users at the end of the run. And then as the field has developed with more and more automation, we've had major requests in order to get towards real-time monitoring. And so we've enabled CryoSpark Live, which does allow our users to see their data being processed in real time as it's being collected. Not only for, does it help with users uh, feeling like they have more control over their samples or get to see things faster, it also allows our staff to kind of monitor progress of the overall project and see whether or not the microscope has gone into misalignment or if the sample just has plateaued. And so this allows us to track individual statistics uh, per image, which you can see on the right hand side, but it also allows us to do 2D classification, 3D refinement and so forth to really track the progress of a sample. The other area that has significantly changed since we started was the original RFA really wanted to focus only on data collection. We had two mandates, one to service the community and do high throughput data collection to generate a bunch of structures for the community. And the other was to provide cross training for users. Now, uh, that was the whole extent of it. Uh, through the process of uh, making ourselves available to users, as well as helping shepherd their projects from start to finish, it really became clear that not only are users needing data collection, uh, but they also need help at the front end of screening their samples, optimizing them to make them available for uh, and suitable for data collection, as well as at the end for data processing. I'll mention data processing a little bit later, but um, one of the key aspects of the screening was that um, we've uh, noticed the need for screening early on, assisted projects in those, and uh, they had to have Creos ready samples to make it through peer review, but then in the process of getting those samples onto the Creos screening to find the best grid and to also help optimize those conditions uh, was something that we enabled. And through that, uh, NIH wound up hearing back from the community as well as creating a separate supplement to create an additional mechanism for to provide access to screening, um, which we recently initiated back in 2021 in 2022, uh, we've been continuing it. So um, along the way, there's been quite a few areas where we've had to evolve and change, uh, but the real crux of the interaction really came from uh, the interaction early on from uh, Karen Rodland and Joe Gray, who really were uh, great liaisons and stewards for their own institutions and had enough networking and trust of each other to bring us together. So with that, uh, Steve can talk about some of the key impacts. Great. Yeah, so um, a little bit of uh, 
breaking about the center and uh, the community around us. So James showed this map uh, indicating uh, the effective outreach that we've been able to achieve. Um, and just some statistics to kind of, uh, you know, showcase the amount of data that's being acquired for our users. So over 400 unique projects awarded uh, with our center. And these projects aren't, um, the, the scope of these projects are relatively large. So we make two year awards to most of our, um, the, the, the major access mechanism that we award to users is up to two years of working with us. And um, so that can involve an entire, um, for example, almost an entire R01 project uh, for individual uh, investigators. Um, of those 400 projects, 200 of them are currently active and about a third of those involve some aspect of cross training the uh, members in their laboratory. Um, a tremendous amount of data is continually pumped out of these microscopes, so um, we run about 500 data collections uh, per year. And again, the scope of, of data is, is highlighted by the amount of storage that has been required. So we have over nine petabytes of data collected over the um, up to date. And so ultimately, all this this work has is, is been um, uh, result in an output from the research laboratories have been analyzing these data. And today we've um, been associated with over 100 publication or preprints and uh, of them uh, over uh, 300 unique structures. And again, this is also kind of um, asterisked with the idea that a structural biology project is, is not a short term project. And so from my own experience in our lab, it, it's often multiple years from the point of um, as James mentioned, kind of screening and identifying good conditions to finally image your your protein sample on a, on a Titan Creos, but then a tremendous amount of time goes into data analysis and interpretation before we reach the stage of publication. And so our rates of publication are still growing relatively exponentially at this point. This slide is just to be a representation of the different types of structures that we see and er, that have been published from our from the center. And this is just meant to highlight um, a, a couple different things and really the diversity of the types of structures and and systems that can be characterized by cryo -EM. And so many of these structures that are represented here fall into the class of membrane uh, proteins that I mentioned early on that are um, relatively intractable to most other structural biology techniques. You can also see a diversity in the types of resolution or the amount of detail that can be characterized by cryo-EM, which is often um, um, reflective of the types of dynamical properties that these systems might have. And so again, these highly dynamical systems are, are often again um, prohibitive to other types of structural biology techniques, but they can be readily characterized at varying levels of resolution by cryo-EM. And then lastly, the, the size of the systems that can be characterized. And so this methodology can be used to characterize relatively small proteins, like this small membrane protein in blue and orange on the bottom left of your screen. So pushing towards 50 kilodaltons in size to multiple megadalton super complexes like the nuclear pore complex, this light blue big ring complex on, uh, on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, just a, a montage here of some of the publications that have come out of the work with PNCC. And again, just to highlight the diversity of the types of science that are being um, explored by this technology, ranging from you know, traditional molecular biology to um, uh, biomedical engineering and, and, and uh, many other fields. And so beyond these kind of um, um, traditional impacts of, of scientific publication has been our ability to contribute to cross training the community in this technology. And we offer various formats of um, training users in all aspects of the Crowium workflow. So we work with people on the upfront um, part of the, the workflow from initially freezing your specimens and screening them on the microscope to collecting data um, all the way through um, data analysis and interpretation. We work with uh, people who've never used a microscope before 
we work with um, people who are experienced in the field, but interested in gaining some um, expertise and some specialized aspects of cryoEM technologies. We also work with cryoEM facility managers to give them uh, to come and work with us and spend extended amounts of time with us to learn how we manage this our facility and, and hopefully bring some of those lessons home to their home facility. And, and um, the idea there is to hope that the users that they end up training become more engaged with our national centers as well. And one of the um, kind of philosophies that we've adopted with our training program is to really keep this as um, small scale and hands on approach as possible. And so you'll notice these various training aspects that we have listed here. They all are listed with like, um, you know, typically six students at a time and multiple trainers. And so these are, are really meant to be impactful so that at the end of the day, uh, a student or a trainee who leaves one of these workshops is actually capable and competent of carrying out the activities that they came to learn. In fact, we're now working uh, together with the other two national centers to develop what we're calling a merit badge system, where if you receive training at any one of our three centers, that training will be recognized by the other two centers and allow for sort of a, a seamless workflow of people engaging with these national centers so that they don't have to go through multiple training sessions at the different uh, national centers. The other impact that we've been relatively proud of and, and, and just starting to kind of reap the rewards of is our outreach that we've really been um, trying to work with engaging folks who come from um, regions that have historically been um, um, underfunded by the NIH. These are the IDEA states highlighted in blue, as well as um, just institutions that ha are lacking in um, high-end instrumentation resources. And so we spent a lot of effort early on reaching out to these communities and, uh, you know, over the first year of all that outreach, we didn't really see a lot of feedback from that and, and we felt a little bit deflated. Uh, what we come to learn is, is, is it just takes time. Um, these people uh, aren't used to engaging in these technologies because they don't have them around. They don't have the funding resources just to to change an aspect of their lab's focus into a technology that they didn't even have at their home institution. And so over time, we've finally noticed this effort to start to pay off and we've built up um, a total of 11 projects at this point from Idea State investigators and that's continuing to grow. Um, and uh, people come in here for short term workshops and as well as extended stays so that they can bring home that expertise to um, leverage into getting some resources at their home institution. This has also involved being kind of creative and recognizing these additional barriers that these investigators uh, come across with accessing these technologies. And so um, one of the, the, the things that we recognize is the ability to kind of freeze samples at their home institution so that they can be independent in that aspect of the workflow and then just ship their samples out to us so that we can help them screen and, and record data for them. And so we developed these low cost cryoEM kickstart kits. Um, uh, PNCC um, worked with this company called Sub Angstrom to develop um, a very low cost set of tools for freezing samples at home institutions in comparison to what was being offered at Thermo Fisher. Um, these tools can be purchased at uh, uh, I'd say 10 to 20 percent of the cost that Thermo Fisher was 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 um, charging uh, the community. And so we're really excited about that. And we're starting to deploy these free of use to people from the idea states. And the last thing that I want to note is just um, how proud I am of our center for the um, sacrifices that went into remaining operational during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in particular, our two center directors, Craig Yoshioka and, and um, Claudia Lopez, and, and some of the microscopists who remained, uh, who, who kept their, their status to go on site in order to load samples for the community um, throughout this time. Um, and we developed remote operations for our microscopists to be able to work from home and, and operate the microscopes um, while being isolated and continue to collect data for users uh, throughout the uh, entire uh, pandemic. And uh, many of these projects were specifically targeting protein complexes 
that were involved in the COVID-19 uh, virus and developing antibodies to target these uh, uh, to target the the virus. And so, um, yeah, that's a really proud aspect that PNCC was able to contribute. To. We'll end here with a little bit of uh, future vision from James. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So you've seen kind of uh, the status of how we got to where we are and where we are currently. Um, kind of going forward, um, one way to think about areas that we could improve is to look at an actual user timeline. Um, this one happens to be a user from a experienced cryoEM group. And it's really helpful to actually take a look at this and delve into it. So the application was originally submitted at the end of April. Uh, it went through peer review and was approved on June 5th. Uh, pretty typical time frame there. Um, and onboarding started very rapidly four days later. Um, so that's really interesting. That entire process overall um, was fairly rapid, but could be potentially improved. But one of the things we've noticed, even from experienced users as well as other groups, is that there tends to be a lag between an a project getting approved and the first request for sending samples. And in this case, it was about four months. And so even though many of our proposals, most of them come in saying that we have samples, they're beautiful biochemistry wise, we could ship them tomorrow, um, there tends to be a lag of several months before they're actually ready to do it. Um, so four month gap to initial scheduling, this, you, these users wanted access to PNCC compute in order to take advantage of the high performance computing and do additional processing on their own. Um, the badging approval was done in about three and a half weeks for that. Um, so their samples arrived uh, a week after the scheduling request and got on the microscope uh, within about two to three weeks. Um, our current queue is somewhere around four to five weeks, um, uh, but uh, from getting on the microscope in November, the first preprint uh, went out for their publication in April and gave them about another whole year to continue their project, look at other samples, different mutants and so forth. And so one of the key areas that I see here is that we have a gap in overall uh, sample availability, um, but everywhere else, if you have an experienced user, uh, things are pretty well streamlined. If you don't have an experienced user or somebody who's newer to the field, there's largely uh, there tends to be longer delays in actually uh, getting a preprint out uh, because they have to become uh, 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 comfortable with being able to process their data and interpret it. And so taking a look at these time timelines really helps us to identify areas. And so the next few slides are just going to tackle uh, areas along that same timeline in kind of a linear order. So just uh, helping users start out from the very beginning of the process, how to submit a proposal. We've completely revamped our website, including making changes uh, to several of the pages. We have training pages as well as a how to access one that provides a step by step view like you can see here of everything you have to do to submit a proposal, how to go through user onboarding, how to get to scheduling and so forth. So making things much more explicit for users has helped um, with uh, transparency and also expediency. But we've also gone and uh, moved away from leveraging the EMSL user portal, uh, which we couldn't customize to creating a complete standalone one, which is completely customizable and allows us to uh, change the way we submit our proposals and be able to make different uh, uh, user proposal formats, as well as uh, make a kind of a framework that was more in common with the other two centers uh, so that users could submit one proposal to one center and then very, very easily copy and modify the text just slightly in order to submit to the other two centers should they choose to. In addition uh, to the evolutions we talked about before, Steve mentioned COVID-19. Before COVID-19, um, uh, after a project was approved, you would have to uh, schedule time on the microscope in advance uh, via scheduling. And whether or not this was a remote use or somebody was coming to visit it on site, everything was done with scheduling. After COVID-19, we wound up move or during COVID-19, we moved to dynamic queue um, where now we have samples as they arrive, they get uh, clipped and then uh, put into liquid nitrogen storage and they're quote unquote ready to go on the microscope then. 
And so then it becomes a first come first serve with some priority provided to COVID-19 samples, then single particle and so forth. But we have this dynamic queue that allows us to now op optimize use of the instruments uh, while not pre-scheduling things in advance and holding things. Uh, uh, however, Going forward, um, there is some value to having a hybrid model where you do still allow some scheduling, especially for users that would be coming on site. Helps with the uh, scheduling for their visit as well as making sure the instrument that they need is available. But the dynamic queue really helps uh, with not only social distancing, but really allows us to control the throughput of the dynamic queue TEMs. And it allows uh, us to switch instruments should one instrument that was uh, scheduled for a particular experiment go down. And the dynamic queue allows us much easier time to be able to shift it to one of the other equi equivalent instruments. Now, Steve mentioned a lot of the outreach and training that we already have been doing, but um, uh, there's also two other mechanisms that we've been working with the other centers on, as well as trying to broaden our outreach to users, especially ones who are more novice or trying to learn how to handle uh, difficult systems. One is that uh, with the other two centers, we uh, host a weekly webinar series that uh, provides insights into cryo-EM current practices. You can see a couple of the more recent ones in the screenshot on the left. And we also, PNCC has its own YouTube channel where we post a lot of these videos as well as a bunch of training videos and how-to videos uh, that really provides that insight for characterizing difficult samples. In addition, Steve already mentioned the merit badge system. This is something that is continuing to evolve and we're going to continue pushing really uh, hard on uh, generating uh, additional merit badges that really fill in the rest of the workflow. Currently, uh, most of the merit badges really rely on the first step of sample preparation, how to freeze your grid and clip it. Um, we're currently working with the other centers on uh, defining other merit badges uh, for actual operations of the microscope and so forth. Um, beyond that, so now you've been able to get a, a project approved, be able to get your samples onto the microscope, get trained so that you can operate it independently and make it even more efficient uh, access. Um, expanding PNCC compute becomes the next, next area where we're trying to enhance uh, overall efficiency as well as access. So um, as I mentioned before, all of the microscope stream data to PNNL and the high performance computing system there. The three uh, red icons of people are different ways that users can interact with their data, either remote viewing in the bottom left of the live sample, logging into the compute resources to process data on their own, or download data. And what we've seen over time is that more and more projects have uh, requested access to PNCC Compute, and we've uh, provided over 800,000 node hours of time to users uh, to date. And so we're currently working uh, this fiscal year to dramatically in, uh, expand the overall compute capacity uh, that we provide to users. But all of this comes together with uh, not only trying to improve the infrastructure and logistics, how to get uh, users in, but also our marketing. And we've had to modify our approach over the years in order to really emphasize that all of this access to PNCC, all of the services and training are really provided free. And that was a message that um, really took us a, a year or two to really uh, resonate with the field. Um, but overall, um, I think we've done a very successful job uh, recently with it. And so I uh, would like to end uh, this presentation uh, acknowledging the hard work of everyone here. Steve and I are uh, MPIs of um, uh, PNCC itself, but all of this work is really um, driven by our two co-directors, our coordinators, our science point, scientific points of contact, um, all the people in the lower left-hand corner. These are the people who uh, interact with our users on a daily basis, and then our data team uh, in the uh, bottom right. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions along with Steve. Great. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much James, James and Steve. James. Um, 
I actually have a question. So the webinars sound like a fabulous idea. I didn't know that you all were doing that. Any yeah. chance you're thinking about doing a podcast? <laughs> Since you those know, are all the rage. Yeah, you know, we had um, had one of our Spocks give um, uh, uh, do like a, a live tutorial using the Discord server. So taking a, a bit of a uh, a tip from like the gamers in the world and you know so the idea would be like the community could just kind of watch as as the microscopist is setting up and ask questions along the way um uh i think we learned a lot from that <laughs> adventure and so with a little bit more controlled environment is is a little bit preference uh for for that but um yeah we're continuing to explore different ways of interacting with people we have another uh spock who is starting to do user interviews so following up with users after posting a preprint or a publication and kind of interviewing them about um, how the center contributed to their effort and posting that interview up on YouTube. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of these ideas come from ideas, uh, homegrown ideas from the microscopists and how they want to engage and highlight their success with their users. And so it's been a lot of fun. We have a few other hands up, Dan and others. Feel free to just unmute and ask. OK, hey, uh, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I mean, um, you guys have done amazing things. It's a great center. Um, I was just curious, like. As we're listening to this, are we like, um, you know, could we be any audience around the country or is there some are there special um, opportunities for people in the two institutions are you seeking to you know leverage additional things for from us in the future um or you know where you just want to inform us about the, the great things that you're doing which like i said are are amazing so just curious yeah you know that's a great question dan um uh, I, I think ostensibly this is a talk that could be delivered to just about anybody. And uh, but I'll 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 say that we're going up for renewal in the next year of the center, and looking for ways to um, demonstrate uh, creative growth of the center and extending potential collaborations and networks. And so, if folks have ideas on how they might integrate well with the center, we'd be uh, more than happy to discuss those opportunities. Okay, uh, great. So I'll I'll think about it. Maybe you and I you and I will chat about it. <laughs> okay, thanks. And I see a hand up over the plus seventeen of other people. I'm not sure who they have. So if you'd like to ask a question, I would say just unmute yourself and go for it. That is Tom. Yeah, I think it might be me. Um, just a quick estimation of all of the structures that you've been able to determine what's the percentage of say a non-protein small molecule versus a, a protein so almost all of them are well all of them are protein based or uh, protein dna complexes um, uh, many of them have uh, small molecules that you're able to uh, visualize bound to them um, i don't know the exact breakdown of that um, yeah. but uh, we don't do any specific just small molecule structural yeah. is that by design based on what the commenton wants you to do or is that just what comes in through the, so the, orig the original remit for the center was uh, focused on single particle analysis and so that has an inherent size limit uh, that steve was yeah. talking about um, so that becomes an issue. The way to overcome that is to um, do microelectron diffraction of uh, 3D crystals and so forth. Um, that's something that has really taken off in uh, recent years. We do that at EMSL, but uh, PNCC as a center um, decided to really focus continuously on single particle. We have had and do some uh, cryo-electron tomography projects as well, but that's an even larger scale. OK, yeah, yeah, I didn't realize the cryo um, or, or the micro electron diffraction wasn't included in the, in the center. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more of a logistics thing that met, that that 
technique um, is is very demanding on micros microscopist time because the data sets get collected so quickly. So it's it's a it's a really rapid turnaround, yeah. and um, and we decided to let the experts uh, deal with that. Uh, so it's actually my former postdoc advisor Tamir Gonan who 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 brought that methodology forward, and he has a a, a center down in Southern California that okay. yeah. is specifically designed for that. Okay, good enough. Thanks. Any other questions? Don't be shy, folks. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, one last thing is, you know, for as far as um, Dan asked about specific things with this community is, is um, if Crown IM is something that you've thought about, how it, it could potentially be integrated into your workflow, um, to reach out to us that the, um, We've worked with people coming literally from from zero uh, knowledge or background in the field, and, and have worked with them to become independent. And so it's 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 not an insurmountable hurdle. And um, we could definitely talk to you about what would be involved to get you to the point of integrating this methodology. Jason, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Jason McDermott. It's great to hear about how far this has come. Um, cause I mean, I've read papers and stuff, but it's really, I, I thought your presentation really did a nice job of kind of giving a good overview of what, where the technology has come and what you can do with it. And that leads me to my question, which is where, where's the frontier? Where's, where do you think you're pushing for the next, you know, the next projects or the next center or whatever that you're, that you're going to be involved in? Yeah. Um, you want to talk or I can talk? Sir? So I'd, I'd say uh, both of us probably have slightly different answers to that, but um, with uh, the rollout of AlphaFold and RosettaFold and so forth, a lot of structures are available online, um, but um, a lot of uh, proteins have intrinsically disordered domains or native flexibility um, or and many of the structures from uh, AlphaFold still have uh, uh, low, low, low scores for some regions, whether or not they're uh, disordered or flexible or just a novel fold. And so there is a, a large open area in the frontier for pushing in that direction, also for pushing towards smaller proteins, like Steve said. Um, CryoEM is suitable for both of those um, to help fill the gap. The other area is um, uh, really electron tomography and trying to visualize these mar larger macromolecular complexes and the dynamics that they have um, as heterocomplexes, um, interacting metabolons, uh, basically, um, or even in the whole cell context. And so there is a whole center, whole separate center funded by NIH uh, for cryoelectron tomography. Um, but it's only one center with one microscope um, to handle all the data. So as I mentioned, the new renewal may have us continue pushing in that direction. We don't know what the language from NIH will be, but Steve, do you have other thoughts? Um, yeah, I think, you know, the uh, along with the things that Jane was saying is. I th so I think the next windfall, the next revolution in the field is really going to be um, being able to study protein structures inside their native cellular uh, context. Um, that is uh, under a really active development and really exciting. Um, at the stage of like purified complexes, I think the real movement there is uh, really trying to um, just bring down the, the, the average target resolution for a lot of things. So average resolutions of like three and a half angstroms are suitable for building a model, but how how accurate are those models to guide like structure based drug design efforts? Uh, they may not be where they need to be. So being able to bring those three and a half angstrom structures down to two angstroms where you can see the waters and, and uh, precise uh, the model of the rotomers at active sites will be um, uh, a level of reliability in these structures that that I think is still needed largely in the field. 
Well, we are almost exactly at two o'clock. And I wanna say thank you so much, Steve and James. This was an illuminating presentation, different than any of the other ones, but I think gives everybody a lot of inspiration on how to think big, you know, going forward with our collaborations. Thank you so much. Thanks, that was everyone. a lot of fun. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful, thanks. Thank you, great job. Right.